It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is uh, to the Premier. When we got back to the Legislature after our uh, winter break, about February, middle of February, the Premier uh, basically dismissed concerns of the third wave, saying that the numbers were, in fact, going down. Today, Speaker, the Globe and Mail reports that hospitals are literally making triage plans, including the use of an online calculator to determine which Ontarians are going to get treatment uh, and which ones are not. Speaker, the government hasn't listened to the experts, hasn't listened to the warnings from hospitals, and now they're dragging us into what looks to be a very serious possibility of uh, a devastating third wave. So I guess my question is, after a year, why does the government continue to not listen to the health experts, to the hospital professionals, uh, in terms of advice around how to curb this virus? The Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak, our government has taken prudent, progressive, and focused action to protect the health and well-being of Ontarians as we've responded to this unprecedented public health crisis. And from the outset of the outbreak, our government has been guided by our world-class healthcare experts who have continually advised us on our response and the appropriate steps in taking to battle this virus. And this collaborative effort has allowed our province and our health system to successfully respond to COVID-19 in a number of ways, such as developing a robust testing strategy, regularly testing over 60,000 Ontarians a day, with more than 12 million people tested to date. And our government has also opened 185 assessment centres, 120 community-based testing sites, expanded testing to over 210 pharmacies to ensure everyone has access response. to testing. And now we're rolling out the, a comprehensive mass vaccination campaign. We're working in all the times listening to our public health experts. Thank you. Thank you. And a supplementary question? Well, Speaker, I want to share with the government just three things that were extremely problematic and continue to be so. One is that the government has ignored advice from all kinds of different uh, places, experts, suggesting that they are going too quickly when it comes to taking away the health measures that will stop the spread. They have failed to support everyday people uh, when it comes to COVID-19. We don't see paid sick days for essential workers, paid sick days for anyone, nor do we see paid time off uh, for people to be able to go get their, uh, their vaccines. We don't see extra measures in schools that we should have seen. The disastrous rollout of this government's vaccine plan has been very unfair and very confusing. Speaker, the, the numbers are climbing. I mean, every day the numbers are climbing in terms of COVID-19, but it is not too late for this government to curb the third wave, Question. and they can do so by implementing some of the things I've just mentioned. Will they do the right thing and implement them? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government's top priority is ensuring the health and well-being of all Ontarians, and it's important to remember that everyone is still strongly urged to continue to follow all the public health and workplace safety measures and limit trips outside their household and only congregate with groups of people living in their household. Since the start of the pandemic, our government has been guided by science and data and our team of expert public health professionals who have continually advised us, which is why, after consultations, our government is allowing for the safe resumption of certain uh, activities activities with public health measures strengthened. It's important to point out that these services and activities still have to adhere to public health guidelines. We have paid sick days through the federal program, as we've said many times, and the first one million vaccines took 86 days to administer. Since uh, then, in 17 days, we've administered a second one million vaccine, so we're ramping Response. up our vaccine rollout and we'll get them to everyone. And the final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier has ignored calls for paid sick days in this province for months and months and months. Everybody knows it. And yet, emergency room doctors are actually identifying that a majority of their patients 
in the ICUs, uh, ICU units are um, essential workers, essential workers who couldn't take time off uh, when they were sick because they couldn't afford to and couldn't take time off to book a vaccination. Dr. Williams, the government's own chief medical officer of, uh, of health that the, pro the Premier says he always listens to, supports paid sick days. Saskatchewan, a Conservative province in Ontario, has actually implemented paid time off to get vaccines. So why does this government refuse to undertake these very measures? Why do they continue to not understand how important Question. these things are to stopping the spread and taking uh, away the likelihood of a major third wave? The government has to respond. Mr. Speaker, as uh, the, uh, the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health just uh, highlighted, of course, there are uh, uh, 20 sick days available to the people of the province of Ontario. What we simply will not do is take the advice of the Leader of the Opposition on this and reduce the sick days to 14 days like she and her party uh, would like us to do. We think 20 sick days is what is important to the people of, uh, of the province of Ontario. That's why we've worked very closely with our partners uh, at the federal level. Uh, to ensure that uh, uh, the restart agreement that was in place and the uh, over billion dollars that was uh, a part of that restart agreement were available. And as I said, uh, 26 days are a part of that, and we just simply will not do what the Leader of the Opposition wants and reduce that to 14 sick days. It's just not sufficient. Thank you. Question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. I think it's clear that the premier's uh, or the government's rollout of their vaccination plan has been pretty disastrous. I mean, it's really been problematic. It's been unfair. Uh, it has been confusing, um, and it's making things worse. Frankly, Dr. Amit Arya says this about where we are right now, and I quote: "Over 400,000 doses are sitting in freezer freezers. Many family doctors are still unable to vaccinate." Hot zones are being neglected. The third wave is here, Dr. Arya says. Why have we dropped the ball? And my question to the government and to the Premier is exactly Dr. Arya's question. Why has the government dropped the ball on the vaccine rollout? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. In fact, our government has done a great vaccine rollout. We've got the vaccine booking system, the provincial vaccine booking system launched on March 15th, and now we have administered in Ontario over 2 million vaccines and over 300,000 second doses. And as I said before, that was 1 million doses within Order. the first 86 days, and 17 days later, we'd administered another million doses. It's important that the member opposite realize that any vaccines in freezers, and I think we've administered already 87 per cent of the vaccines that we have, but eight, um, any vaccines in freezers are actually already allocated to individuals. They are for appointments that have been booked, and we don't want people to have to show up for an appointment and find there is no vaccine. Vaccine. When we have more vaccines from the federal government, more vaccines will be going out quickly. Response. We can easily ramp up to 150,000 and more daily, and we want to do that. We want all Ontarians to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier and his government like to play the blame game, pointing to Ottawa, but Ontario is fifth when it comes to the per capita vaccination rate uh, in our province, and we know that the rollout has been disastrous no matter what the member of opposite tries to claim. Pharmacies in the GTA were forgotten. They were left off the, off the list in those neighbourhoods that were the hardest hit by COVID-19. It's shameful. In fact, even to this this day, when, when I, communities identify that they're going into crisis, they can't get an answer from the Ford government. The mayor of Sarnia is ignored. Now, not only do they not get an answer, but they certainly don't get any vaccines. So this is not an indicator of a good rollout speaker. Order. When will the government finally admit that they have a problem here and fix their Question. disastrous vaccine rollout? Order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Um, the campaign for vaccine rollout has been wildly successful, as I indicated. To this point, 80% of people over the age of 80 
already have a vaccine or have booked for an appointment. And the, the group of 70 to 79 year olds, one third of all Ontarians in that age group have a vaccine. So we're making great strides. And all of this is, of course, dependent on receiving vaccines. The AstraZeneca vaccine that we received was 194,500 doses received from India, which was to expire on April 3rd. Those vaccines were given out and allocated to various pharmacies, 325, I believe, and also to some doctor's offices. When we have more vaccines, those vaccines will get out to all of the pharmacies. I believe we have now signed up 700 pharmacies, and we're ready to double that as soon as we have Respond. the vaccines to put in the pharmacies. We want to get them out there, and we want to vaccinate all Ontarians Order. as quickly as possible. The final supplementary. Oh, the vaccine rollout has been wild, all right. It's been wildly disastrous, Speaker, wildly disastrous. But you know, it didn't have to be this way. We didn't have to be in a situation uh, where we're headed to more lockdowns, where we're headed to a third wave that could be quite horrifying. We could have had paid sick days in our province. We could have had paid time off for people to go get their vaccines. We could have had smaller class sizes and better protections in schools. We could have had a vaccine rollout that Minister actually of Education targeted those who were most at risk. We didn't do any of those things in Ontario. Our Premier didn't want to do any of those things in Ontario, but it can still be fixed. So will he? Will he fix it? Member for Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Our government has run a very successful vaccine rollout campaign, as I have said. We've launched our online booking system. We've Order. signed out hundreds of thousands of people for appointments. We are getting the vaccines rolled out. 87% of the ones we have have already been administered, and we are doing that by priority group. The member opposite will know that we managed to vaccinate 90% of uh, all long-term care residents fully, and the numbers in long-term Term care have shown the results of that. Member We've, for the Ottawa death rate has declined order. significantly and almost to uh, a, a complete stop, which is the vulnerable group that needed the priority vaccinations and got them. And that is how our plan is working. We've moved on to the elderly, which are the most at risk because of age. Member and we Brampton are now moving North on to order. other groups at risk because of age and because of Response. transmission uh, risk. And we will get those vaccines out to those people quickly. As soon as we have them, they will go out. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of the Environment. Last week, the Supreme Court made it clear climate change is real. It's a threat to our humanity if governments don't act. This government wasted $30 million going to court that should have been spent on building a real plan to fight the climate crisis. And we've learned they also hired a climate change denier to provide quote unquote expert testimony and defend the Premier's gas pump stickers that, as you know, Speaker, didn't even stick. After losing two court battles and millions of dollars wasted, can the minister tell us how much public money went into the pocket of this climate denying Trump supporter? The, the question is to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the member opposite for that question. Um, you know, since day one of being elected as government in 2018, we have worked hard to make life more affordable for families and businesses, while at the same time ensuring that measures are taken to protect the environment, which produced our Made in Ontario Environment Plan, Mr. Speaker, that not only protects land, air, and water, it also focuses in on reducing greenhouse gases to achieve our Paris climate uh, target of 30 percent emissions below 2005 targets, and we're well on our way, Mr. Speaker. We have a number of initiatives that the member opposite knows that we put forward to reduce uh, emissions, such as our uh, heavy-duty uh, emissions, uh, uh, emissions uh, testing to get the heavy-duty trucks emissions down, our emissions performance standard, which we're in the middle of implementing with partnership and approved by the federal government, which will uh, ensure the big polluters are held accountable for the function they're making, but it's a fair and tough policy moving forward, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to uh, telling the member opposite more about our plan for the environment in the, in the supplemental. In supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the government certainly made life better for climate deniers, no question. This government hired Benjamin Zicker for $111,000. I want to note some of this man's opinions. Racist personal attacks on Michelle Obama, 
Islamophobic hatred against Muslims, going to bat for Donald Trump to deny climate change. He's so discredited that he attacked the Republicans in Congress for quietly acknowledging climate change. The government's only actions to date on climate change include millions on wasteful court battles that can only be defended by climate change deniers. Why has this government aligned themselves with climate change deniers time and again, and when will they bring in a Green New Deal to actually deal with the climate crisis in this province? Mr. The Environment, Conservation Parks. Well, thanks again for that question, Mr. Speaker, and that uh, uh, the person the member uh, mentioned uh, is probably going to come on against uh, our government as well. I mean, we know climate change is real, and we know it's a threat to uh, the people of this province and the country. But what we would don't agree with the member opposite is we have a different way and a plan of dealing with reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, which not only keeps life affordable for families, not only allows businesses small and medium sized to stay open and compete. It also balances out with strong environmental protection, Mr. Speaker. And I've already mentioned our emissions pro, uh, reduction uh, standards for industry across this province. We're also coming out with Ontario's first uh, low carbon hydrogen strategy. And I know the member opposite may not be supportive of that, but this is going to be moving forward another alternative to lower greenhouse gases in our, in our communities, whether it's uh, mixing with natural gas, a new source of uh, low carbon Hunts. or zero carbon emission vehicles, uh, trains and buses, Mr. Speaker. I'm pretty excited about our hydrogen strategy coming out. This is in addition to the $20 million we put towards conserving more land throughout this province and $30 million we put towards the wetland res restoration in this province. Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, if you consider the population growth in GTA, we will experience in the coming years there's little doubt on the need to invest in public transit. We need to get building. But it is not just accommodating this growth. Speaker, is also about protecting the economy. This government has critical subway projects underway, all of which will stimulate future growth and job creation. Residents in Richmond Hill are so excited, they just cannot wait, especially when this month the initial business case for the Young North Subway extension was released. Could the Minister of Transportation speak about the significance of this news? Thank you. Minister of Transportation to reply. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Richmond Hill for her question. We are full steam ahead on all of our priority transit projects because now is not the time for inaction. Last week, the Minister of Finance spoke about setting the foundations for long-term economic growth, and I couldn't agree more. It has been estimated that every $100 million invested in public infrastructure supports $114 million in real GDP. Infrastructure creates jobs. Consider the Young North Subway extension, Speaker. The equivalent of 4,300 full-time jobs will be created each year of construction. The IBC shows that almost 50,000 people will be within a 10-minute walk of a station by 2041 unlocking access to employment and housing opportunities. This extension will connect Go and Viva, making it easier and faster for people to get around. We are working closely with York Region and the City of Toronto, and I look forward to sharing more in the supplementary. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is very exciting, Minister. We just cannot wait. This certainly is a compelling case for moving forward with these priority transit projects. I understand that the federal government has a role to play here too, eh? In the 2019 federal election, the Prime Minister committed to supporting these projects, yet we haven't seen any money. Economic recovery is a priority that is national in scope and we need our federal partners at the table with us. Could the minister please provide an update on the status of her discussions with the federal government on the funding of these subway projects? Mr. Transportation. Thank you again to the member from Richmond Hill for her question. Our four subway lines are nationally significant, and they mark the most ambitious transit expansion plan in Canadian history. These are critical stimulus projects for our economy and I know that the federal government shares this same view. 
So I am taking the Prime Minister at his word. We are asking for at least 40 per cent in funding towards the priority subway projects and a contribution towards an updated Hamilton LRT. This is a continued call not only from Ontario, Speaker, but our municipal partners as well. We've provided business cases for all five priority projects, and we have nominated each of them under the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. Speaker, all three levels of government agree on the importance of investing in shovel-ready projects. The Response. federal government is the last piece of the puzzle, and we need them to make good on their commitment made in the last federal election. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwet Good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. The Abmatung First Nation is one of Ontario, ha, has one of the Ontario's longest boil water advisories, and it uh, also has a severe housing shortage. Multiple generations live in overcrowded homes without adequate heat and plumbing. Currently, Mr. Speaker, there are 17 people living in tents and shacks in the, in the winter weather. You cannot isolate from COVID-19 in tents. Yabmatung has so far been able to stop the spread of the virus, but they need resources to uh, stop COVID. Speaker, when will Ontario stop playing jurisdictional ping pong and address the severe housing shortage in Yabmatung with a real plan to address the crisis. Thank you. Government House Leader to respond. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, I accept uh, uh, the member's uh, criticism, and I understand uh, uh, his, uh, his, his knowledge of, uh, of that area, and I, I wouldn't even begin to pretend uh, that I have the, the knowledge that he has on that. But uh, uh, it's less about jurisdictional ping pong, Mr. Speaker, than it is uh, about the, the need to actually work together, not only with the, uh, the, the federal government on an issue like this, but also with the, the affected uh, uh, First Nations. We've seen, uh, uh, whether it is through, uh, through, through housing uh, or, uh, or through the COVID uh, uh, action plan, uh, frankly. Uh, there has been a lot of work that has been done uh, that has been accomplished by, by working together. And uh, uh, look, this is something, uh, uh, an issue that uh, uh, we inherited, uh, and it's not just something that we inherited from a previous government. It's something that has been an issue uh, for many governments dating back many, many years. Uh, but I am with the gentleman uh, in, in, in suggesting that we have to do a better job uh, uh, working together on this. And uh, it is is unacceptable uh, this day and age. Uh, Response. Uh, but, I, but I say very sincerely to him, we can't uh, not work with our federal partners and with our First Nations on this. The only way we'll solve this is by working across uh, uh, party lines and with uh, all partners at the table. The supplementary question. Back to the Premier. Speaker uh, Philip Wabus and his wife lived in one of the tents I just told you about. She was in poor health and on dialysis while living in a tent with no proper heat, no running water, no kitchen, no bathroom or toilet. She passed away this winter in these conditions, Mr. Speaker. Why is, that, why is this acceptable for people in First Nations? Speaker, Ontario is a treaty partner with the Abmatu, with Treaty Number 9. How is it possible to not have a proper place to live and die in? Where is the decency? What will Ontario do to alleviate the housing crisis immediately? Thank you. And to reply, again, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and again, I, 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 I agree with uh, the, the, honourable, the honourable gentleman. Uh, uh, these are issues that have to be tackled uh, in, the province, uh, in the province of Ontario in cooperation with our First Nations partners uh, and in cooperation with the federal government. We, 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 we can't simply work in isolation on, on, on these issues. I think the honourable gentleman would agree with us. Uh, would agree with us on that. He has spoken uh, often and eloquently about the need for governments to work with First Nations and not dictate to First Nations. But he is absolutely correct. It is unacceptable in this day and age that uh, that we should have bottled water uh, advisory or boil water advisories uh, in the province of Ontario. 
I note that the federal government had, uh, had promised that that would uh, be a thing of the past. They've made some progress, yes, but they have a long way to go. Uh, it is, of course, uh, an issue that we Response. inherited uh, uh, when we took government, uh, but it is not just the fault of the previous Liberal government. It's the fault of many governments. We will continue to work very closely with our partners. We will get the job done. We have to. And I know that the Honourable General will hold us accountable for uh, uh, to getting that done. Thank you. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, the Premier's thrown millions of dollars away on lawyers trying to defend his fringe climate change views. While the majority of world leaders align on the need to take immediate action, he and his government are holding Ontario back from tackling the greatest challenge of our generation, and his government is dangerously out of touch with their new reality. With a global pandemic underway and worsening effects of climate change, Ontarians need and deserve a government that prioritizes our children's future and recognizes the connection between economic prosperity, health, and the environment. Not a premier who fights science and environmental protections to help his friends. So, Mr. Speaker, I have to ask through you: Does the premier even believe in man-made climate change? Minister of the Environment, Conservation, and Parks. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and the member opposite. Uh, as I mentioned in the last uh, response to uh, the opposition. Uh, this is a government that believes in uh, climate change. We know it's a threat uh, to uh, the prosperity of Ontarians uh, and to our future, and that's why we took measures once we were elected uh, to come up with a plan that not only uh, fights climate change and deals with having a clean, strong environmental protections, we've also taken the measures to balance that out with affordability uh, and economic uh, uh, strength in our province as well. Uh, the member can note in our Maine Ontario Environment Plan there's numerous uh, uh, projects that we've moved forward on to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for instance, uh, I mentioned earlier about the new emissions uh, perform, uh, performance uh, standards for uh, heavy-duty vehicles. Uh, with our federally approved uh, emissions output uh, pricing Response. that is coming forward, Mr. Speaker, we're working with industry in a Maine, Ontario solution that is going to lower emissions from the big heavy polluters of this province, but also keep them competitive, keep jobs in Ontario, while we uh, work towards our goal of 30 percent reduction in GHGs by uh, 2030. Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, supplemental is also for the Premier. The money the government has spent on lawyers to fight science and environmental progress could have, been put, could have been put to much better use helping Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. The Premier's wasted millions pandering to conservative climate change deniers by cancelling the cap-and-trade program, axing Ontario's environmental commissioner, spending $30 million to fight uh, climate change uh, with the federal government, spending $231 million to cancel green energy projects and kill jobs. They're selling off the green belt, and Mr. Speaker, they're bypassing environmental protections through ministerial fiat. The Premier has fined business owners tens of thousands of dollars for re refusing to display the government's partisan anti-climate propaganda stickers, and the court has struck it down as being unconstitutional and a misuse of the governing party's legislative power. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll ask again. Does the Premier actually believe that climate change is real? And if he does, Question. why does he tolerate me members of his own caucus, like the member for Oakville North Burlington and other climate change skeptics in his party? The Minister of the Environment. Thanks uh, very much uh, for the question from the member opposite. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll repeat uh, this government uh, believes in climate change. We know it's a threat uh, to the prosperity and the safety of Ontarians. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I do have to. Uh, comment on the member that uh, he made mention of is this is a government that is uh, in current consultations now to expand the green belt. Uh, one of the largest expansions we'll be undergoing in decades. That member opposite is part of a party that cut up the green belt, shrunk up the green belt over its term in 15 years in government, Mr. Speaker. We aren't going to do that, Mr. Speaker. We're going to protect and conserve the green belt in this province. We're also going to uh, invest uh, $30 million to protect and restore wetlands to the province, something that government and opposite member didn't do when they were in office, Mr. Speaker. And we also have our $20 million uh, Greenlands Partnership Program. We're working with Nature Conservancy of Canada, Mr. Speaker. Spons? We are conserving quality, uh, productive land in this province. Uh, province for future generations to love and enjoy, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, once again, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, COVID-19 has many hit many Ontarians hard, including our children and youth. Our young ones have been facing additional stress 
throughout the pandemic, whether with school or mental health or more. Speaker, we must ensure that these kids are supported throughout the pandemic and beyond, and we must work together across ministries to help these children and youth. Speaker, can the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services please explain to the House what our government is doing for the children across Ontario throughout this pandemic? The parliamentary assistant, member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Richmond Hill. You know, we know that the member from Richmond Hill is a fierce advocate for seniors in her role as the parliamentary assistant, but we here on this side of the House also know that she is a fierce advocate for children as well. Speaker, the member is absolutely right. Children and youth in Ontario need to be supported throughout this pandemic and beyond. That's why, thanks to our Minister for Mental Health and Addictions, our government is making historic investments into mental health health across the province, including for children and youth. This includes mobile mental health clinics for those in rural, remote communities like youth who live in Northern Ontario. And through the work of the Minister of Education, we have been working hard to keep schools safe, as well as making the necessary investments to build and upgrade schools. Speaker, we are also Response. supporting children and youth in residential settings by providing funding for infection and prevention control. This is a cross-government effort, and we will continue working to keep our kids safe today and into the future. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much, PA. Youth and children are the future of Ontario. Yes, we have to take care of them. And, Mr. Speaker, I thank you for... Uh, what we are suggesting. However, I also want to, to touch on the other area that the children are particularly vulnerable. They are the part of our child welfare system. Statistics have shown that the high school graduation rate for kids in care is only 46% versus 83% of all youth in the same year. With the changes the pandemic have created, their health and well-being is all the more critical. Speaker, can the Minister of Children and Women's Issue share on our government is what our government is doing regarding Question. child welfare system to that children and youth who have been hit and left by the Liberals and NDP will now have a chance at success? In response, the member for Ottawa West Speaker, and, and thank you to the member again for raising that important question. Speaker, all children and youth in Ontario deserve the same level of care and support no matter their circumstances. This is no different for those who are part of our child welfare system. The Minister of Children and Women's Issues has been hard at work redesigning Ontario's child welfare system in partnership with First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and urban Indigenous partners, with the Black and other racialized communities, those with lived experiences, sector leaders, and more. And, Speaker, the Minister earlier this month announced that our government was extending the moratorium so no youth would age out of care until September 30, 2020. 2022. She also stated that our government would be developing a new model for youth leaving care Response. so that they feel more prepared as they leave. This model is being developed with those who have lived experience with the system. We're committed to getting this done right. We're committed to our youth, and we're going to keep moving forward on this important priority. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Brampton is suffering from a health care crisis. But instead of acting now to fix this crisis, last week the Premier made an empty promise to build another hospital in Brampton without a single dollar in the budget or any plan. He was actually called out for this lack of plan and money and came to Brampton last Friday to clarify his position where he doubled down and admitted that there's no money in this year's budget to build another hospital and instead made an empty election promise to do some work on Peel Memorial in 2023. That's after the next election. People in Brampton need investment now to fix our health care crisis, not in two years after the next election. That means building another hospital in Brampton. That means investing now to convert Peel Memorial from a health centre into a hospital and properly funding Peel Memorial. Why is the Premier 
using Brampton's health care crisis to make empty election promises. Parliamentary assistant, member for Edmonton Lawrence, to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Speaker, our government is supporting the transformation of the Peel Memorial Centre for Integrated Health and Wellness in Brampton from a day facility into a new hospital with a 24 7 emergency department. I don't know why the member opposite is using this for political grandstanding, but I'm delighted that we're proceeding with this. Peel Memorial will provide a range of services. Uh, currently, it provides outpatient services, but it will, this will support the transformation of Peel Memorial into a new hospital, and we're funding the construction of over 250 new beds at the site. We're also providing $18 million in the 2021-22 budget to expand the urgent care centre to 24-7 operations, paving the way for the emergency department to come as Peel Memorial expands into an inpatient hospital. This added investment is part of our government's additional funding of $3 billion in health care infrastructure, which was part of the 2021 Response. budget. We're delighted about this new urgent care centre and emergency coming to Brampton, and I, I wish the member opposite would join us and celebrate. Here, here. And Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Brampton is a city of over 600,000 people, with only one hospital that is chronically overcrowded and underfunded. But instead of working to fix this crisis, the Premier came to Brampton a year before the election to campaign. What was supposed to be an announcement for a new hospital in Brampton looked far more like a pre-election campaign stop, full with fake empty promises for a new hospital, and in addition, numerous partisan attacks against the NDP. Bramptonians don't need the Premier to come to Brampton, to come to our city, and to campaign a year before the election. We need him to get to work today to fix our health care crisis. Will the Premier commit today to investing to fix our health care crisis in this year's budget? That means investing to convert Pym Memorial Question. from a health care centre into a hospital, properly funding Brampton Civic, and building another hospital in Brampton. Number five, Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I watched the press conference, and I thought it was a great announcement, and certainly the local members, uh, the mayor and everybody else in Brampton Order. embraced this new announcement of uh, Peel Memorial Hospital becoming a uh, emergency department and a hospital with inpatient uh, facilities. So, and as I said, this is part of our $3 billion in health care infrastructure that was part of the 2021 budget. And these investments will help to ensure that the people of, uh, of Brampton have access to 24-7 hospital services, including urgent care, complex continuing care, enhanced mental health, and rehabilitation for patients and their families. The people of Brampton deserve this, and this government is going to deliver it to them. And it's not politicking, it is what we have planned, and we are delivering it to Brampton. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontario's ICU admissions are on the rise, and hospitals are once again dangerously close to being overwhelmed. And we're on the verge of enacting a triage protocol that, for most of us, is unthinkable. And the Premier's priority today is another campaign style announcement in Niagara. It's as if Friday's shameless political plug on the public dime wasn't enough. For too long, the Premier has been too focused on too many other things other than the most important ones, like the vaccine rollout. Today, seniors in Ottawa trying to book their appointment, if they can get through, are getting one in August. It's the same problems we had last week. So up until this point, we haven't been able to get vaccines into the right arms or to the right places fast enough. So, Speaker, through you, with case counts rising and the third wave ready to slam us, why is the Premier continuing to focus on campaigns? The response, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, our government has been working with our hospital partners to create unprecedented capacity and be ready to respond to any, any scenario and to ensure that anyone who requires care in a hospital can receive it. Uh, we have put an additional $1.8 billion in the hospital sector for 2021-2022, bringing the total additional investments in hospitals since the start of the pandemic to over $5.1 billion. Those are a lot of investments, but we've also started running the 
most successful, frankly, and largest mass vaccination campaign in the province's history. And we've been getting the vaccinations out there. As I said earlier in answer to a question, the first 86 days, it took us 1 million, 1 million doses, took 86 days. The second uh, 17 days, 1 million doses. So we've now got 2 million doses out into arms. And we've got 80% of people Fox. over the age of 80 have an appointment or have a vaccine already. And uh, over the 70 to 75 to 79, one third have been vaccinated. I call that. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Speaker, it took you half a million doses and 60 days to get to the 70,000 patients in long term care a first dose. I don't call that success. I don't think anybody else here does either. So the Premier's own advisors, the science table, have continually advised him on the risk of the third wave. The Premier has ignored much of that advice and now loosening public health restrictions. And now we find ourselves back where we were again, except this time, worse. The head of the Ontario Hospital Association says Ontario is on track to surpass 420 in our ICU units, the peak. It's like we learned nothing from the first wave, or the second wave, and there continues to be no sense of urgency from this government. The vaccine rollout and public health measures require the Premier's fullest attention. So, Speaker, through you, when will the Premier Question. stop campaigning and start focusing on the things that are most important to Ontario families? Member Fragleton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker, and thank, uh, thank you to the member opposite for the question. The Premier is focused on what matters most to Ontarians. He has been throughout the entire pandemic. He has been in front of Ontarians every day and dealing with the issues at hand. And the vaccine rollout is certainly a very high priority for the Premier, as is ensuring that our health care system continues to provide the care that Ontarians expect and know. And our government's top priority, as we have said all along, is ensuring the health and well-being of all Ontarians. So the member opposite should know that we're still encouraging everyone to follow public health measures and workplace safety measures and limit trips outside their household and not to gather with individuals outside of their household in order to stop the spread of COVID-19. We have been working with our public health experts to allow some easing where it makes sense, but we're providing standards to make sure the public health measures are still Response. in place and people are following them. So we think it's very important to help Ontarians to get through these few months before the vaccines hopefully you get to everybody and we're working hard to make it a livable experience for all of us so we can get to the end of the tunnel and see that light. Thank you. The next question, the member for Milton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for the Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, last week, the Minister of Finance delivered a strong budget that will protect the health of people of our province and also our economy. Mr. Speaker, there's been a historic $1 billion investment into broadband, and now this budget commits an additional $3 billion to help connect more communities to reliable internet service. Mr. Speaker, of course, I represent Milton, and a lot of people may not know, but uh, part of my riding, there's a significant rural component, also a rural component of Burlington that I represent, Mr. Speaker, and I'm honored to represent each one of my constituents. And one of the concerns that I hear each and every day, Mr. Speaker, it's from families, it's from students, it's from small businesses, and it's from farmers, uh, Mr. Speaker. Question. So I'm wondering if the Minister of Infrastructure can please elaborate what this commitment means to everyone in Ontario. The member for Oakville and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, from uh, Halton, uh, Milton, my Halton colleague, for the question. Mr. Speaker, our government's primary focus is to protect every life and every job we possibly can from COVID-19. Without healthy people, we can't have a healthy economy. Ontario's action plan protecting people's health and our economy is the next phase of our response to COVID-19. With our 2021 budget, our action plan now totals some $51 billion. Part of this investment goes directly to getting more Ontarians connected to the digital economy to ensure that nobody gets left behind. We know that there are some serious barriers faced by people across this province as they learn and work from home. That's why we've stepped up to the plate to do what the federal government has neglected to do for decade upon decade. 
We're taking the steps to ensure 100% connectivity no matter where you live in this great province. From Barrie to Bancroft, Halliburton to Halton, from Manitoulin to Mississauga, no one will be left out of today's 21st century digital economy. The supplementary question. My colleague for that answer. Mr. Speaker, this pandemic has shown us exactly why broadband is so important to the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we've heard stories of Ontarians who try to go online to do simple things like book a vaccine appointment. Because of the poor internet connection, they're forced to book an appointment through a telephone. This is an important government service Ontario needs and deserves to be able to access barrier-free, Mr. Speaker. That's why I'm thrilled to learn that our government's $4 billion investment will help connect my community of Milton and the rest of the province. Can the minister please tell the House what other steps are being taken to ensure that all Ontarians have reliable internet access regardless of where they live? Yeah, thank you again uh, for the question, Mr. Speaker, and uh, to the member. Like the member mentioned earlier, we've all heard the stories and we can count on our fingers the number of times we've experienced drop calls, spinning wheels as documents download, and abrupt video call interruptions because there simply isn't enough bandwidth. These challenges are very real and, of course, been magnified by the pandemic. That's why we introduced the Supporting Broadband and Infrastructure Expansion Act 2021. If passed, this legislation would help connect communities to reliable, high-speed internet sooner by accelerating the deployment of provincially significant broadband infrastructure across Ontario. Did you know that 700,000 households across Ontario lack reliable, high-speed broadband? On this side of the House, we know that 700,000 is 700,000 too many. That's why we're taking action right now. We simply cannot Response. wait for the federal government to step up. We need the support of every member in this House to connect Ontario, and I urge all members opposite to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this weekend, like all weekends, I've heard from <clears throat> excuse me, hundreds of, of frontline educators, parents, students, uh, talking again about how the shift to em emergency remote learning during the pandemic has been a really rough one for students, for education workers, for their families. I mean, surely what we've learned from this experience is that kids need to be in school face-to-face -face with teachers and education workers for their mental and emotional health and, frankly, for their academic success as well. It came as a real surprise, Mr. Speaker, last week when parents and students across Ontario uh, found out that this government is quietly moving forward with a scheme to move more students out of classrooms and online permanently. Mr. Speaker, why, after such a difficult year, when so many of our children and youth are struggling, is the Premier so set on undermining the quality of their education? Thanks for education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we believe parents deserve a choice. They benefited in September from having an in-class option, which the vast majority of parents exercise, and an online option, which roughly 25 percent of our collective constituents chose for their own personal uh, circumstance, be it health and their family, or the choice of their child learning online, doing well in that, in that forum. We believe in choice. We believe in allowing parents to make that choice. When it comes to next September, I think we appreciate the pandemic is not going anywhere. And I think a lesson learned is to be ready and prepared and to think ahead while preserving the choice parents could retain. For the vast majority of parents, I don't expect them to enroll their child online. They continue to benefit from the development of learning in class, and that makes a lot of sense to me. But for that minority of parents that prefer it, for the 40 percent of high school students that maybe want to access a physics class that they cannot access in their small school today, this is an opportunity to diversify, diversify course offerings preserve choice, and make sure educational quality is provided online and in class in this province. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Premier. Families in this province want their kids learning safely in school. But instead of investing to make our schools safer and protect students and staff from illness, this government has been winding down COVID-19 supports. They are laying off education workers, and they're trying to find a cheaper way to educate our students. This plan takes online learning out of the hands of school boards and siphons it off 
precious public dollars going into the hands of for profits. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, when this government talks about choice, we know what that means. That is code for privatization in education, and we all know it. Will the Premier Order. listen to the chorus of parents, educators, and school boards who have come out against this plan and scrap it? Mr. Speaker, so that parents understand where the opposition parties are at on this. They oppose the choice online learning was provided to them in September, meaning under their plan, under Democrats and Liberals, they would not have had the choice this past September to opt in online Order. or to provide their uh, student learning in class. They also would have kept schools closed in 2021. They have consistently been on the wrong side of parent and public opinion when it comes to quality public education. Here. Our Premier believes in giving parents the choice of publicly funded in-class learning or publicly funded online learning provided by Ontario certified teachers. We believe when it comes to strengthening the ability of families to learn in their own circumstance, respecting the choice parents made, uh, but by investing $40 million more in the budget, as we did, to improve the infrastructure, to improve connectivity, a historic $3 billion investment to, get, to end the digital divide. These types of investments will ensure never again will students have to learn at home alone. They will be provided with excellence in learning online and in class. Here, here. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Here, good morning. My question is for the Premier. During the 2018 campaign, the Premier said this government was the only fiscally responsible option for voters. He would fix our fiscal mess and put money back in the pockets of taxpayers. Last week, this progressive government released its third budget in a row, offering no tax relief for individuals or businesses and no plan to balance the budget. Instead, sustained deficits of over $20 billion until 2023-2024, deficits until 2029, and with our province's debt-to-gross domestic product ratio finally eclipsing 50 percent. Can the minister please explain what part of running deficits over $20 billion in 2023 and 2024, after pandemic-related spending has ended, does he consider fiscally responsible? Member for Willowdale and Parliamentary System. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the member highlighting an important issue, and, and obviously this level of spending is, is not uh, sustainable moving forward, but uh, this government will not make apologies when it comes to the health and safety of the people we serve, Speaker, and our Premier has been very clear from the outset of this pandemic that he would spare no expense to that end. And this budget is another example, our third phase in our $51 billion action plan to get us through COVID-19. A measured response, $16.3 billion into the health care system, Speaker, because there is no economy without healthy people, Speaker, and we will not cease. We will not uh, relent on those investments into health care. We know that these are investments to fix a fragmented and disjointed health care system, Speaker, and oftentimes out of crisis can come opportunity, and this revolutionizing, modernizing the health care system, Speaker, is, is an example of that, Speaker. We will continue to prioritize the health and safety of all Ontarians through the pandemic and beyond. And the supplementary question? Well, it remains that the most recent budget is evidence of yet more promises made and more promises broken by this progressive government. Another promise recently made, I add to a long list of others, came on March 17th. The Premier posted on social media, once the pandemic is over, quote, we are going to ramp up this economy, the likes of which this province has never seen. We are going to create more jobs, more opportunities, get businesses going so they can thrive and prosper and grow, end quote. Yet, in the government's budget, they predict that in 2023 and 2024, the two fiscal years following the pandemic, government revenues will only grow by 2%. Can the minister explain why, if this government will be implementing pro-growth strategies, they expect such a paltry growth of Ontario's economy after the pandemic? Member for Willowdale. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And I know that uh, when, you're, when you're protecting the health and safety of Ontarians, there's no price tag you can put on, on accomplishing that goal, of course, Speaker. And there are some that believe that the path back to balance in, involves austerity measures and cuts to programs and services. And there are others uh, that believe that you need to increase taxes on individuals and small businesses. But this government, Speaker, believes that that's a false choice, that there is a third path, that we can invest and bet on the people of this province. And that's exactly what we're doing, Speaker. We know the growth will return to Ontario. We saw that in our first two and a half years in government when we saw record job growth leading not just the country but North America in terms of increasing those revenues to the province. We're modernizing government, improving the programs and services that we offer, Speaker. I'm very optimistic about the future that we have and we will continue 
to be transparent with the people of this province. That's why we are tabling this budget hot off the heels of the last one in November, and we will continue to hit our fiscal reporting uh, targets until we are out of government, Speaker. And I hope Response? for the sake of the people of this province, that is a very long time from now. Thank you. The next question, the member for London North Centre. My question is for the Premier. Teachers have done an outstanding job in the face of this year's challenges, and students have shown such resilience. Yet last week, the government announced their cuts to education, laying off thousands of people, and we are now in the third wave. Kim, an educator in my riding, told me that all her classes are currently above the cap, packed with so many students, she can't even walk between the desks. She said just the other day, 96 jobs were left unfilled across the board in London. The 1.5 extra educators that the minister claims are clearly not enough, yet this government is plowing ahead, regressing to earlier merciless cuts. Ryan tells me educators have done everything they can to make education work for kids, yet are being lambasted by our own minister. No respect, no appreciation. And teachers have been promising students better days ahead and that things will get better, but getting education, making online learning Question. permanent, devastates children and parents' mental health. Why does this government keep trying to balance the budget on the backs of students? Mr. Education. For precisely 12 months uh, during the pandemic, the one constant has been the refrain from the members opposite suggesting that this government has not invested or hired a solitary new person, teacher, custodian, EA, to support safe schools. Today, uh, or for the past week, Order. given the political opportunism now, there's $1.6 billion of critical supports that must be renewed. And I guess I ask the question, which one is it? I mean, for a year, we didn't invest. Today, these investments were so consequential to the safety of class, they have to be renewed. What we've done in our budget is provided a $700 million net year-over-year -year increase, a $40 million enhancement to our internet, as well as our remote learning connectivity, $100 million, the largest summer learning program to mitigate learning loss in Ontario history, and we have a grant for student needs, the upcoming uh, principal vehicle funding to school boards, Response? which will be released in the month of April, that will continue to demonstrate a focus on mental health, on special education, on mathematics and STEM learning, so that all students could succeed next year. And the supplementary question. Back to the Premier. Through you, Speaker, earlier the Minister talked about how parents want choice, but e-learning has always been a choice. I would have really appreciated hearing the Minister show some recognition for the work of educators and show them some respect. Speaker, these cuts could not have come at a worse time. Students in London need a government that looks forward and invests in their education instead of handing down merciless cuts. Despite best efforts, many children have fallen behind. Maintaining an investment in education would help kids catch up. Alia, another educator in my writing, tells me that the so-called training for online learning was, here's your login, go make it work tomorrow. Alia said many teachers even had to supply their own technology. So here we are. Families and teachers propping up the education system because of the government's neglect. To this day, Pre I haven't spoken with any student or educator who has seen a public health nurse in school, despite the minister's promises. Speaker, the Liberals underfunded our education system for years. Question. Why, during a pandemic, is this Conservative government doing more of the same? Minister of education. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, um, as one parent said in a recent media story, um, kids, different kids have different needs. They have different ways of learning, and I think definitely online school caters to a lot of them. Another parent said, I do think there needs to be change in our education system, and this could be one of the ways it could be better. Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, we are ensuring students have a choice when it comes to learning online and in class. Now, we are still consulting on the matter, uh, as has been noted clearly, but I think we believe as a default that giving parents, the Ontario moms and dads, the option to opt into online learning or simply to never opt in if they oppose it outright or it doesn't work for their kids. The Order. fact is, Speaker, this choice in September uniquely positioned Ontario to lead the nation by providing safe learning when we had to close schools as a consequence of advice by the Chief Medical Officer of Health and Response? the public health environment, we had a backstop that kept our kids learning. That was, that was essential, and we'll continue to improve it, to strengthen it, and provide the choice to parents going forward. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Gaul. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontario's affordability, housing affordability crisis has worsened during COVID. Lack of affordable housing affects everyone, 
but it affects the most vulnerable the hardest, increasing homelessness in tent cities. Many people experiencing homelessness are also facing mental health and addictions challenges. They need investments in supportive housing that include wraparound mental health and addiction services. The federal government is supporting housing projects, but we need the province to step up with the funding for mental health supports. Speaker, it seems like the affordable housing chapter of the budget was forgotten at the printer. So since supportive housing is essential to ending homelessness and a vital part of any mental health and addiction strategy, will Question. the Premier commit today to provide immediate funding for supportive housing? The response, the member for Milton and parliamentary assistant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government believes everyone deserves a place to call home and supportive housing is a key to helping address homelessness, Mr. Speaker. That's why we are investing over $2.2 billion in supportive housing every year. In 2021 alone, our government has allocated just the city of Toronto, Mr. Speaker, with $489 million in various housing and homelessness funding. However, under the National Housing Strategy, Ontario currently receives 33% of available funding, despite having 44% of the Canadian households in core housing needs, representing a funding shortfall of $490 million. We will continue Once. to work with all levels of government to create and sustain much needed affordable housing units, but Ontario needs its fair share of the National Housing Strategy funding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our time for question period this morning.